Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to the third episode to the series on our channel that we like to call Who Did It Better? Of course this is a collab production with Okami Viking, so why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and explain what we're doing here. Hey y'all, Akami Viking here with another Who Did It Better with Anime Sam. This is a series where me and Sam take two different series with similar elements and put them against each other and find out which is better, in our opinion of course. So both ReZero and Steins Gate are anime that I'm fond of, as Sam as well. I'm fond of Steins Gate because of its sci-fi elements and ReZero because of its take on another trapped in the world anime, or Isekai. The thing is... Although it doesn't seem like it at first, you can definitely see elements in both these shows that pertain to each other. For example, both anime revolve mostly around an ordinary guy who does its best to protect those he cares about, no matter what the cost or what he has to do. Both guys are suddenly caught in a spiral of disastrous events. Both have something to do with the butterfly effect or traveling back in time, as it were. Both main characters are pretty powerless and non-significant at first, and both will stop at absolutely nothing to save those they care about. So, as you heard, we'll be comparing a common theme which for this episode is time travel. Or for the people who don't call it time travel, the effect of being reset back to a certain point in time. And the elements of that theme on which we'll be forming our repetitive scores on are the approach to time travel, the cause of time travel, the character progression through the grief from the whole process, and the nature of fate in the series, which I'll explain once we get to that part in the video. I really want to reinforce the fact that we are not comparing the two shows as a whole, but rather how the theme of time travel is implemented, approached, and used as a plot device. And just a reminder that these scores are based on our own opinions, so don't needlessly hate if you don't agree with us, just let us know what you would have scored it and why in the comments below. So allow me to kick things off with how time travel is approached in each show. Let's begin with the more complex show, ReZero. <laughs> nah, I'm just fucking with you, it's uh, obviously Stein's Gate. In fiction, there are normally three different scenarios for which time travel can occur. You can have either mutable, immutable, or alternate timelines. Mutable simply means that the past can be changed to affect the future. In which case, immutable by default means that the future can't be changed. An alternate is simply a change in history that causes a new timeline with a different future. Therefore, Steins Gate clearly deals with mutable and alternate timelines, and also mixes in a little bit of what's called the black hole theory. Essentially, the science of it works this way. Okarin is in a mutable timeline. However, there are some events that cannot be changed in this singular mutable timeline, such as Mayuri's death. However, there are also the alternate timelines that are called detractor fields. The main timeline changes to the alternate timeline when there is a major event, and this alternate timeline is mutable in its own way, but also has its own limits as to what can be changed before converging to a different alternate timeline. Therefore, once in a timeline, it follows a set of rules as to what can change and what cannot. Once the past is changed past a certain point, it converges to an alternate timeline which then has its own set of rules and limits as to what is changeable. As for what constitutes time travel in this series, there are two components, Future Gadget Number 8, aka the Phone Microwave, and D-Mail. D-Mail and the Phone Wave go hand in hand. The Phone Wave creates curved black holes that allows data and objects to travel back in time. So D-Mail simply refers to the text data that is sent back. The Phone Wave was later modified by Kurosu to be able to transmit a person's memories as well. So clearly this being a sci-fi show, they really wanted to go in depth as to how the time travel worked. Which is why in terms of their approach to it, I'm going to give Steins Gate a 5 out of 5. On the other hand, ReZero being a fantasy show has a much different approach that some would even refrain from calling it time travel. The concept for this series is much more simple. As Okami will mention, it's called Return by Death. There was a lot of speculation about this ability and how it came into Subaru's possession, so I can't really get too in-depth as to how or why it works. But as I'm sure you already know, and as the name states, once the user of Return by Death dies, they are brought back to life at a certain point in time, as many times as it takes. And this is where the fact that this is a fantasy show comes into play. All we really need to be concerned with is the origin of this power rather than the science of it. But considering that in the show we have yet to gain any information on this aspect of Return by Death, I have to give ReZero a 3 out of 5 in its approach to time travel. Now I'm going to pass it on to Okami who's going to cover the reason for time travel and the character's progression through repetitive use of it. Now, Steins Gate uses D-Mail. D-Mail is short for DeLorean Mail and refers to all the mails sent back in time by the main character throughout the course of the anime. The mails are generally sent back through the microwave phone and are generally phone messages. In one case, a paper message is sent back, which is also considered a D-mail, interestingly. D-mails can only be sent in their entirety if they're as large as 36 bytes or smaller. Any additional content will be cut off. This message is interesting, to say the least. Now, in a way, both reasons they go back in time are similar, because a death. ReZero is Subaru's and Steins Gate is Mayori's. Now, Mayori's death is quite tragic, especially because Okabe's reactions to it. 
and how he becomes numb to it eventually. Mayori's a sweet character, but honestly, I find her a bit bland. Please don't hurt me. So, if I'm being honest, the deaths she experiences don't hit me as hard. Um, what does hit me hard are the characters acting towards it, and what they react to it. You know, like I said previously, Okabe's shock to terror to determination to stop whatever it is, and to the eventually numbness to it makes it tragic, not the death itself. So, for the method that makes them go back, I'm going to give Steins Gate a 3 out of 5. ReZero's return method is called Return by Death, which is, appropriately, returns to a user to a save point after they die. It's been suggested multiple times by various people that this ability is connected to the missing authority of pride, yada yada yada, but nothing's really been confirmed. Subaru's deaths are often cringy to look at, not because they're bad, mind you, but because I felt the pain. Remember when you see a dude on TV kicked in the nuts and you feel it in the pit of your stomach? It's kind of like that for me when I see Subaru die. Subaru dies often because he's trying to save somebody else and because he's so weak. Because, you know, he's just a regular dude who got transferred. I'll tell you right now, I'm giving Reesier the edge here, and I'll tell you why I think that. The reason is because often when the characters died there, when they died, I felt bad. I, I think it's a thing to say. I really cared about the characters that were being killed. When Rim died, I cared. When Amelia died, I, I cared. Not as much, but I cared, mind you. The only reason ReZero gets an edge here is because I care about certain characters more, and I think they have more going for them than simply Mayori does. Now, I like Okabe better than I like Subaru, but Subaru's reactions to others' deaths don't feel me as much as the deaths of all their characters themselves. Really, it, it goes for one reaction compared to several others. And because I don't care about Mayori as I care about most, a lot of the cast of um, ReZero, mostly Rim, Subaru, and Amelia, I have to say that ReZero gets the edge of this. Four out of five. Now, before we get into the character progression, I'm going to talk about the nature of fate first, because it relates slightly more to the general motive for time traveling in each of the shows. And what I mean by this is the level of which the future can be changed in order to alter one's fate. Let's start with ReZero this time. One can argue that his attempts at saving Amelia are even more futile than Okarin's to save Mayuri. But it's a very close case to argue because as we've seen so far in the show, his timeline is completely mutable without any known limits. The only existing rule so far is that Amelia is the one to die, and that's kind of a stretch already. And even after preventing one death, she or somebody else close to her will die at a later point. But from that perspective, is it fate for Amelia or someone else dear to him to die, or is it the opposite? And is it Subaru's fate to be stuck in a loop trying to save the people from a tragic end? As of now, it's unclear what exactly Subaru is destined to do, but the nature of fate seems to be the exact opposite of Stein's Gate, since the death of someone can be prolonged for an indefinite amount of time given that the right moves are taken. Since Return by Death is seen to be used as many times as possible, Subaru can run through an infinite number of combinations until he finds the one that gets him to the next save point. Therefore, given that the fate of the characters in ReZero are not quite laid out yet, we see only vague elements of a predestined outcome. However, it still seems to have the faintest effect on the overall outcome of the story. Since this show was able to make it seem like Subaru has the ability to beat fate, but still have him endure that much suffering was something definitely worth watching. Which is why for this category, I'm giving ReZero a 4.5 out of 5. Stein's Gate, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. Okarin is trying to escape one of two fates, or futures. A one where Mayuri dies, or one where Kurisu dies. These two outcomes are inescapable unless he goes to another alternate timeline where somebody else's life is completely messed up. But that's relevant because the rules for these timelines have already been set in stone, and those are the events that are unchangeable. So Fate has a much stronger hand in this show, and serves as a great contrast against a show like ReZero. Unlike ReZero, where someone could potentially be saved forever, Mayuri is destined to die in the main timeline no matter what Okarin does, therefore his efforts will always be futile. So Stein's Gate's much more straightforward approach to the strict hand of fate grants it a 4 out of 5 in this category. Ring is a large part of ReZero. Indeed, a nickname for the Subaru is Sufferu, for good reason too. Throughout the anime, he gets sliced by Elsa twice, dies, stabbed by a thug, cursed by a dog, dies, maced by Ram, and dies, windbladed by Ram, and dies, suicide by jumping off of a cliff, and dies, frozen by Puck's magic twice, and dies. Keep in mind that this is just in the anime. In the original web novel, he dies a lot more because it's, you know, further long gone. Subaru's outlook on his respawns are at first disbelief. He believes at first these are dreams he has, but then he realizes he really is dying. This has both positive and negative effects on him throughout the anime. 
In the beginning, he thinks it's a dream, but later comes to realize that he really is dying. At first, he seems to be at peace with this, using it to help his newfound love of Amelia and helping push her forward. However, Subaru comes to the realize the toll that the deaths take on his sanity. Hell, he even goes insane for a loop until best girl Rims inspires him to take action. Subaru gets a big head from all the times he saved Amelia, eventually driving her away as she can't stand to see him hurt himself for her. This breaks Subaru's heart, but ultimately it's not hard to see why she says these things, seeing how much he dies each time. His deaths both help for his character progress and regress. That might not make much sense, but let me explain. It's more of Subaru's descent into madness and how he overcomes it. He shows huge signs of mental deterioration. It's evident that he's far different from the start of the series. He literally treated it as if it was a video game. He was happy and excited to be in a new world and was in awe of all the characters that were around him, even starstruck as he saw Amelia. As the series goes on, however, he does retain some of his old self, but that slowly disappears and every time he dies, not only does he lose his life, but he loses a small part of himself due to the trauma he received from dying and the events that led up to that point. Emotional and psychological trauma is a serious thing and we bear witness to his fall into insanity. It's easy to see how he's affected, but not just by being killed, but the memories with the people he cares about that are erased too. His memories exist with Amelia when he helped return the young girl to the Appa merchant. The first time he did the victory pose with Amelia is gone too. With Rim, Subaru knows that she killed him twice, but she has no memory of doing that. Before Rim killed him for the second time, Subaru hits a breaking point when he realizes that the memories he had with everyone only exist within him when he's yelling at Rim. During the Amelia Subaru argument that I had mentioned previously, it's even more apparent that he's becoming more and more delusional that this world only exists for him. He shows a lot of entitlement, to say the least. He points out that he saved Amelia and others countless times, yet to them, he's only saved them once or twice. He keeps losing his sanity each time he dies, but still, he tries to save everyone. Only he can see that, and Amelia can't. That's because her version of her exists just in Subaru. She points this out, actually. She's not aware on how they met, or what they did together. This breaks Subaru down even more, and knowing that when he fails, the memories are gone forever for him. These feelings are gone, and everything is gone. The only thing that exists for him are the ones he survives in. He's literally surviving in a world that he really has nothing else but his knowledge. But he's also living in his own little world that he's surviving. To me, I think that makes Subaru a different kind of hero. Uh, sure, not all heroes are brave and stuff, but... As far as character development goes, I think this series focuses on him crashing and burning. And then he rises, as a different person. If the previous Subaru fails, the new Subaru will prevail as long as he keeps on standing up. Subaru is a pretty cool dude, I think. In the lap pillow scene, he truly loves being with everyone. He tries so damn hard, and every time he fails, a part of him dies knowing that his attempts are only known to him. We don't know Subaru, or what his life is like, but on this side, I think he's a hero. And to me, the character progression through grief in ReZero is 4 out of 5. Now for Stein's Gate. Steins Gate is an excellent anime that will show you how odd the notion of time travel is right before throwing you into the time travel, you know, anime thing. All the characters are pretty engaging, some more than others, but the one we'll talk about today is the main character, Rintoro Okabe. First off, he's not actually a mad scientist. His secret lab is really just a loft that he rents, and he's not really holding that girl Mayori hostage, and, you know, he has a cool time machine. Initially, Okabe might seem confusing. He's a university student that never goes to class, not that I know anything about that, is prone to maniacal laughter, and, you know, talking as if he's bigger than he is. He claims to be a superhero named Hyunan Kiyuma, who's intent on ruling the world and is obsessed with stopping the organization. He doesn't become off as believable, just some dude you'd see on the street, and this is kind of what makes him charismatic in a way. Seeing as we're watching him through a television stream, the disconnection, it helps you see him through an objective thing. It makes him somewhat charming. His personality, his mad science personality that is, is something that he's constructed and it doesn't take long to see that the man has some issues. Later on this series, when we're asked why he created the lab, he's basically said, because I have no friends and I couldn't invent them. The act, while strange and a bit odd, actually manages to get some empathy for him. We see that he's not really a supervillain, just a lonely dude willing to burn some time, you know? The act is shaken whenever he comes across the body of Karisu, whom he'd only met a bit ago. He sends a text about one of his two friends about his find and everything changes. 
He's whisked into a world where she's still alive, and his tasks arrived one week before he sent it. After some confusion, Okabe declares that he's successfully built a time machine. The red-haired girl joins the lab with his friends, Daru and Mayumi. And together, the four begin a series of experiments to test the limits of their time machine. At first, the series is light. The gang gains more members, they send more and more text messages. Though he's shocked by his things, Okabe doesn't really drop the mad scientist act, save for moments where he's really shocked. It's clear that he cares about the people he's with, and though he refers to them as assistants, you can tell they're his friends. Then everything breaks down. One of his friends turns out to be an agent of CERN, an organization looking to develop their own time travel device to control the future, an Illuminati type deal. Agents of CERN break into the lab during a party and kill Okabe's best friend. Over the few days, Okabe and Garisu manage to develop a different kind of time travel device. This one is capable of sending memories to the past. You hop into a you from the past, fully aware of what happens to the future. Okabe uses uh, this device and watches his friends get killed all around him and is sent back mere hours. At this point, the act drops away completely. He's desperate to save his friend. Okabe seeks her out and does his best to escape from the certain agents. However, a different accident occurs. And Mayori dies anyway. Again, and again, and again, and again. Okabe leaks back in time over and over, but he's not able to save her. He does manage to obtain help, but he needs time to convince her every leap. Eventually, they get the idea that undoing all the demails they sent will help it. Here is where it gets worse. Okabe is so obsessed with saving Mayori, he begins to crush the dreams of those who helped him before. It's pretty heartbreaking to watch all these people slowly getting more cynical. It takes its toll on Okabe as well. Every demail he deletes only gives Yori a day or two. He even goes so far as to let her die to discover the precise time she dies to further calculate his chances. Keep in mind that Okabe's been traveling for weeks now. Much like Subaru's deaths, for other people, it's only been a couple of days. His friends never have any idea what's going on, and only their dreams let them know that they've had something they've now lost. Eventually, Akabi realizes that the only way to save Mayori and stop CERN is to switch back to the original timeline. In the new world, Okabe's friends are distant, save for Daru and Mayori, and his love is dead as well. Okabe had shed his entire personality, you know, the mad scientist one, and he seems broken. He's no longer the lovable Okabe, the guy who was just charismatic with his weird personality. He's just a man that's just been through absolute hell. Then he gets a phone call about stopping World War III. It turns out in the new timeline, in order for World War III to be averted, she has to live. So, Okabe goes back in time, but accidentally kills Kazuru himself. Oops. Completely destroyed, he collapses on a roof among his friends and says, I'm done. That's it. Then, he gets a message from himself in the future. The future Okabe tells him that the terrible trials he went through served to give him strength. And that if he wants to save the woman he loves, he has to do it in a mad scientist way. The way he would. The future Okabe is a total reversal from who he usually is. His mannerisms are similar, but he's Okabe how you would want him to be. Okabe is a man who he didn't think he was. He was played in being a supervillain the whole time because he didn't think he had much going for him. But it was this trait that helped him in the end. And that's why I love him, because he really needed to be the thing he wanted to be. Steins Gate is an interesting story because of that. And although I like Subaru and the character progression through grief that he goes through, I give Steins Gate a 5 out of 5. Alright, so the results are in. ReZero took the cause and fate categories, but it was Steins Gate's perfect scores in the time travel method and character progression that had ReZero beat with a total score of 17 out of 20. So if you made it to the end after watching this whole video, well, goddamn, thanks for watching. Whoever you are, you have my utmost gratitude for listening to us for upward of 20 minutes. But as always though, thanks again for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So until next time, ciao!